Hi, I'm Julie with the Elite Graduate Program. Welcome to Show Me the Money. Today we have, actually we have a speaker and a backup speaker for questions. Uh, our speaker today is Bethany Bauman, and she is a financial assistant advisor with the Office of Student Financial Assistance. She's been with the in the office for six months. She holds a Bachelor's of Science degree and is currently working on her Master's degree in higher education. Our other presenter, question answer person, is Elsa Garcia. She is also a financial assistance advisor with the Office of Student Financial Assistance. She has been employed with the university for 14 years. She holds a Bachelor's of Arts degree, a Master's in Public Administration, and a Master's of Science in Education. She is currently pursuing a Master's in Counseling and is hoping to become an LC, LPC, yes. Licensed Professional Counselor. She's earned all her degrees here at Texas A&M University. With that said, let's welcome Bethany. And it's just good to go? Yep, just put it on. Y'all have to let me know if it clanks against my necklace. I had a, in my last job, I used to do lots of presentations, and one time I had a microphone on, and unbeknownst to me, it was clanking against my earring the whole time, and I kept getting these really weird looks from the audience, and finally somebody was like, you're having a wardrobe malfunction. So please let me know if there's any background. Um, as Julie said, I am Bethany. I'm from the Office of Financial Assistance. Um, I'll be doing the presentation today, but um, my coworker, Elsa, my trainer, she'll be here to answer uh, specific questions. I promise you there's not a question that you can think of that she cannot answer for you. Um, but what we're going to do today is we're just going to give you a brief overview of financial aid um, for graduate students because it is different um, than, than when you were an undergrad. I don't know how many of you pursued or utilized financial aid when you were an undergraduate student, but it is different. So we're going to touch on that today and see if we can answer some of your questions. As I go along, please feel free to stop me and ask questions for clarification um, so that, like I said, just please feel free to stop me. Um, we'll get the bad news out of the way first. Unfortunately, graduate school is funded by student loans primarily. There is little to no grant money for graduate students. Um, and as I'm sure most of you guys know, the state of Texas is suffering from a massive, massive budget shortfall and higher education always takes one of the largest hits when that's the case. What that means is that the state grants, which is what there was for graduate students, um, are either there's very little left or it's gone away altogether, okay? So now that we've made our peace with that, who qualifies for financial aid as a graduate student? Any U.S. citizen or eligible non-citizen, you must be enrolled or accepted for enrollment, at least half time in an eligible program at an eligible school. Um, half time for graduate students is technically 4.5 hours. If you can accomplish registering for 4.5 hours, I want you to come see me in my office because I would just be tickled pink. That's going to default for most of you to six hours. I have every once in a while seen a student who had a five hour course load as a graduate student, but very rarely. So bear in mind you must be in at least probably two graduate courses to utilize your financial aid. Um, for men, you have to be registered with Selective Service and you have to complete your FAFSA. Do you guys know what I mean when I say FAFSA? Your free application for federal student aid. We're just gonna call it FAFSA. Oh, that's okay. Uh, what we have here, what is the Stafford loan? Now the direct loan program. Depending on how long you've been in school, I know when I started my undergraduate, I was getting Stafford loans, and somewhere along the way it changed over to the direct loan program. So we will put both terms up here because some of our students, we figured you're graduate students, you've been in school longer, you're probably used to getting Stafford loans. Stafford loans are now direct loan programs. It's called the direct loan program because now the money comes direct from the Department of Education to the university and we give it to you guys. Whereas before, I don't know if you guys remember, you had to go pick your lender. They've done away with that. So what you'll see on your award letters and on your sale account is direct loans, okay? This is a low interest student loan regulated by the federal government. We know that it's not based on credit worthiness um, and it's available to everyone who applies for FAFSA. 
which is good because we just talked about graduate students, you're going to have loans. That's, that's the only kind of financial aid you're probably going to get. There are two types of direct loans that we offer to students, subsidized and unsubsidized. The subsidized loan is based on financial need. And that's determined by the information you provide for us in your federal student, your free application for federal student aid. Um, the government pays the interest on this loan while you're in school during the deferment period, during your grace period, which is that six months after you get out of your program, um, or drop below half time in school. That clock will start ticking. They will pay the interest on it so long as those things are being met. Or if for some other reason, if you go into repayment and then pursue another defer deferment. Um, unemployment deferments, um, if you go back to pursue another graduate degree, you can go back into deferment. The federal government will continue to pay the interest for you on that, okay? Unsubsidized loans. An unsubsidized loan is an interest-bearing loan. It does accrue interest while you're in school. Um, if you don't qualify for a subsidized loan, i.e. you don't have enough financial need, we will offer you an unsubsidized loan. Wait, did I say that wrong? If you don't qualify for subsidized, you'll get offered an unsubsidized loan, okay? Um, the same deferment rules and things like that apply. The only difference is this is accruing interest while you are in school. You are not obligated to pay the interest while you are in school. If not, it'll just capitalize into your loan principal. And I've got a chart up here to show you just to kind of a visual. But you can, if you can afford to. I do encourage students, if you can afford, because the interest rate is so low. Right now we're at 6.8%. If you can afford to pay the interest, I encourage students to do that. If not, don't worry about it. You will not be penalized for that. These are your maximum limits per year. There is a limit on how much you can borrow per year in the direct loan program. You guys can disregard the first, second, and third year. Those are for undergraduates. You've passed that now. For graduate students, the maximum you can borrow for ye per year, and it, in financial aid year at Texas, at our school, is August. So it's going to be your fall semester, your spring semester, summer one and two. The maximum you can borrow for all those terms is $20,500. I stress that because what's going to happen traditionally is we are going to offer you the bulk of your student loans. We're going to offer you the maximum amount fall and spring. If you utilize all fall and spring loan money that we offer you, there is no mo loan money left for summer. Okay? We do that because the biggest financial burden on you guys will be your fall and spring semesters. Your aggregate, your lifetime limits. Okay? There are lifetime limits. At some point, the, go the U.S. government says, okay, you, you, can, you cannot borrow anything else, okay? Keep that in mind if you're pursuing multiple degrees, okay? Or if you're going on to your a PhD program or doctoral program. Um, $1,000, wait, $138,500. That might sound like a lot, but when you consider what it costs to get through an entire program, and that if you have student loan debt from when you were an undergraduate student, uh, in a minute here I'm going to give you a resource, a website you can go to to see where you're at already what you have borrowed thus far. Um, you guys, I'm assuming you guys all know that. You know exactly what you owe. It's just my undergraduate students who come in and they're like, what? No, I have no idea. I don't know what I borrowed. This is your lifetime maximum. This includes, like I said, PhD students, graduate doctoral students. This limit is the same, OK? So when do I begin paying back my loans? Six months after you complete school and or Stop going to school, okay? Whenever you drop below half time, which we determined for you guys, it's gonna be six hours, that six month clock will start to tick. So when you're out for the summer, it's not six months, so it's, not, it's kind of a non-issue. But if you take off summer and fall, you're beca you come dangerously close to expiring your six month grace period. You will go into repayment, okay? When you go into repayment, the minimum payment is $50 a month. The payment has to be equal to at least the interest due on the loan. Your payment plan is going to default to the standard repayment plan, which is 10 years. There are a myriad of repayment plans. There are payment plans for every student and every family in every situation. There's no reason to not be able to make your payments. And I'll go into that in more detail. Um, but I know because as graduate students, you do have a larger loan debt to manage. Okay, and usually graduate students, you also have 
more of a personal life and professional life to manage. So it can sometimes become problematic to keep up with and pay your student loans. But we're going to talk about all the different ways that you can make sure you stay on top of that. Some lenders offer discounted rates for on-time payments. There is no penalty for prepayment. Okay, so if you come into a windfall of, of, of cash for some reason or your finances are in a way that you can actually start making payments while in school, you can do that. You're not going to be penalized for that. This is a sample of repayment amounts based on your loan amount. I don't have a buzzer thing. So because we are graduate students, we're assuming our loan, we've borrowed more than an undergraduate. So let's look here at, let's say we borrowed $20,000. Our interest rate right now for subsidized and unsubsidized loans is 6.8%. So your payment per month on a standard repayment plan that's, that's saying you're going to pay it off in 10 years is somewhere between $222 and $232 a month. Okay? And then you can see $30,000 or, if, it's, or if, if you've borrowed less, if your interest rates go up. But that's just an example, and that's based on a standard repayment plan. If you, get, if you finish with your graduate program and you don't have $230 extra dollars a month to start paying, we're going to look at some other payment plans. <clears throat> um, just an example before we move on and talk a little bit about other repayment plans. Um, we know that an unsubsidized loan, that's accruing interest while you are in school. Okay? This is a small example. If you borrow $2,000, our interest is 6.8%. We accrued $748 of interest. When you graduate, you're actually paying and accruing interest on $2,748. Okay, so this is where we talked about if you can't afford to pay the interest while you're in school, it will save you a lot of money in the long run. If not, you just need to be aware that it is rolling into your principal. This website right here, I encourage all of you to, um, you can access it, I think, through our website. We have it up there. This is a national student loan database system. You log in using the same information that you'd use to fill out your FAFSA every year. This will give you every loan that you've ever taken out for school, except private loans. So if anybody in here has pursued a private loan, that won't be there. Um, but this is all of your school loans um, from undergraduate. It'll have all that on there. We talked about earlier checking where our limits were. This is where you can do that. This is also where you can tell, am I in my grace period? Am I in deferment? Have I gone into repayment and just don't know it? Because if you moved and didn't tell your lender, they can't find you, which doesn't mean you're not in repayment. This is just a snapshot of the NSLDS website. And this is what it looks like once you're inside. This is a student um, that's gone all the way undergrad, graduate, and then PhD. You can see each loan here gives you the loan amount, the loan, your disbursement dates. So if you feel there's a discrepancy, you can think back, well, did I take that loan out or did I cancel it with my school? Did it not get canceled? Um, it even shows you the canceled amount, the outstanding principal, and the interest. If you click on the blue number, it will give you specifics about each loan. This is what is specific if you were to click on, say, number 10. This is what you're going to see. It tells you the type of loan. It tells you what school you were at at the time. And it shows you your lender and your servicer. This is if you have questions about if you have repayment information. This is going to come in hand real, I mean, it's going to be really handy when you go into repayment because if you're going to consolidate your loans to get one payment, it's going to have address and and loan amount, it, all the information that you need, because you'll need that to fill out the consolidation application. Yeah, the application is long. It's it is very detailed. It's very detailed, but like she said, everything is here. There's nothing on the application that you can't answer by going to this site. So on the off chance that you cannot pay, we talked about so you get out of your program and you're looking for work or you have other financial burdens, what happens if you can't pay? And this does happen. Default and the consequences, okay? A loan is considered in default when you have not made payment for 270 days. Default is a very big deal. I can't stress that enough, and you'll see in a minute why. Um, if you are in default, your wages can be garnished. We see students on a regular basis who have had their wages garnished. They do not garnish your minimum payment. They garnish 15%? 15%. 
Fifteen percent. Fifteen percent of my paycheck is not something I'd want to part with when I know what my student loan payment is. It is not fifteen percent of my and paycheck. They didn't even take it now for Social Security. They didn't used to be able to do that, but they sure can now. They take this very seriously. Um, your income tax, your refund, if any of y'all were expecting refunds, you're in default. The IRS just says, oh, thank you for your payment to your defaulted student loans. You don't see that money. Uh, Elsa did actually have a student who was in default on her loan. She won $2,000 in the lottery. She knew she was in default, so she sent her boyfriend. He went to cash it. He was in default on his loans. The tax office said, thank you for this payment on your defaulted loans. They will just keep all that. You will no, definitely not be eligible for financial aid. So if for some reason we do this sometimes, we see this sometimes as well. If there was a break between your undergraduate and your graduate program, and you somehow fell into default between those two programs, we can't offer you aid until that default is fixed. And the problem with that is that if you are on a schedule and you want to start, you can't just call up the Department of Education and be like, OK, I just want to pay and get caught up. I'll pay the $900 or whatever I owe. You have to make consecutive payments for six months before they'll lift the default hold. So for six months after you've made arrangements, we still can't offer you aid. Um, it is on your credit, just like a credit card. So it will affect your credit, which affects your ability to get houses, cars, you name it. So how do I avoid uh, this defaulting on a loan? Always notify your lender if you drop between, between half below half-time enrollment, um, if you completely withdraw or drop all your classes, you move or transfer to another institution. Because if you withdraw here, but say you start at UH, but your lender doesn't know that, you're going to go into repayment. Because as far as they know, you're not in school anywhere. Um, if you're unable to submit your monthly payment, call them before it gets to that point. A deferment is a time when your lender suspends your monthly payment. Okay? Um, they have so many options for deferment. You name it, they have it. Medical hardship, economic hardship, unemployment. We have lots of students utilizing that right now. The job, the job market is difficult, but you have to contact them. And then forbearance, that's going to be your last recourse. You do not want to go looking at forbearance until you have exhausted all your deferment options and you've exhausted all your repayment options. Because a forbearance, <clears throat> um, this is a negative thing. I'll be very candid with you. You don't want this showing up on your credit report, and it will, that you are in forbearance. Being in deferment doesn't show up on your credit report. In fact, being in deferment, it looks like you're making your regular payments. It's just zero. Being in forbearance is not a good thing. Before I talk a little bit about the scholarship opportunities, um, I wanted to touch briefly on, we talked about alternate payment plans. I don't have a slide for it. Um, the standard repayment plan is 10 years. Um, now they also have what's called income-based repayment, which is just what it sounds like. Um, I don't know how often you see it as in, uh, in graduate students, but I know undergraduate students, a lot of you, when you finish your, your, your undergraduate degree, you're what's called underemployed. You know, you're new to the workforce. You're just not making that much money. So what happens in income-based repayment is they base your monthly payment on what your income is and all your other living <coughs> expenses, OK? So they can actually, I know when I finished my undergraduate degree, I was working for a nonprofit making nothing. It was good experience, but I wasn't making any money. And that's the plan I was on for the first year or so I was out of college. And my payment was $50 a month, when it should have been higher. Um, they have income-based repayment. We have, what's the other one? Uh, income, 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 income contingent. Uh, we have the standard. We have a, a graduated payment. Uh, would that be what graduated is? Is that you uh, start off with a small payment, but eventually end up with a much bigger payment? And again, that's based and on the fact based that they're assuming you'll be growing your career, yeah. and so you'll be earning more money. Um, we also they also they also offer loan forgiveness depending on what your field is. Um, health professions, if you work for the state, if you work in education, uh, law enforcement, law, military. Um, military. If you're able to make 10 years of regular payments and you make them on time, they'll forgive whatever's left over. And depending on how much loan debt you're carrying, that could be useful, OK? There are some scholarships available for graduate students. Um, you want to go directly to the graduate college to inquire about those. Or Julie, do you have information about graduate scholarships? We weren't we sure. Refer them to grads. Okay, website. that's what we do. Okay. Um, 
So there are some, and they're specific to your college, whatever college you're in. And then here are some uh, dates to keep in mind. But again, free money, scholarships, grants for graduate students, they are more difficult to come by than, than um, when you guys were undergraduates. OK? Do you have any questions? Only one time, right? Only, we can only apply one time. For financial aid or for? No, uh, scholarship. That is a good question, and I don't have the answer to that one. I would think you could apply every year. I think, um, it, de I think it depends on the, the college. scholarship. Yeah, the college and whether it's renewable yeah. or not, the academic. Um, oh, right. I know there's a scholarship, scholarship for uh, first year uh, math students, and you can only apply. And uh, which makes sense because like, it's your so first it's year. Like the first 12 hours, they'll only offer the scholarship for the first, for the first right. 12 hours of your first master's. So it's going to be it's going to be scholarship well. specific. Sometimes, the answer to your question. Sometimes it's worth reapplying because they get more funding. They they'll have extra funding left over and they'll just go back to the applicants and give it out to people who have already gotten it before. Cuz I know that's how we are. If once that money goes back, if students either don't come back or drop out of the program, their money goes back into the pot and we can redistribute yeah. it. So it sounds like the scholarships for graduate students. We get all Yes, definitely. For scholarships for graduate school, you want to go directly to the department um, to inquire about that. Way. No, and the same goes for undergraduate because that money goes fast. So don't don't do don't miss those deadlines. All right. Well, if y'all have if you get to a point and you do have specific questions, that's what uh, Elsa and I and we have other coworkers in the office. That's what we're here for. You are more than welcome to come in and sit down, and we can talk specifically about your award or your financial aid concerns, even if you need help applying for your FAFSA, if you have questions about information and stuff like that, that's absolutely what we're here for. We're in the round building, student services, y'all probably know where to find us, but we take all our students on a first come, first serve basis, so please feel free to stop by and um, with any questions. All right, 